time. I got an email this week. Someone said, hey, I think we need to start that back up. And it made me realize that I've been forgetting it. And if I forget it, y'all don't hesitate to go ahead and remind me. I would say throw something at me, but he's sitting on the front row, and he's good at aim. Good aim, so. So, choices. Choices that we make. Um, <clears throat> Adam and Eve had a choice to make. And did you know, Adam and Eve were progressive adults. They could almost, had they not been born over there, they could have been Americans. Because when they were caught doing something, the first thing they did was pass the buck. It wasn't my fault, it was his fault. And he said it wasn't my fault, or she said it wasn't his fault. He said it was her fault. She said it's not my fault. It's the snake's fault. And the snake just said the devil made me do it. But truthfully, American society has got to a point, uh, I read this and I can't remember where I read it. Uh, American society has got to a point where everyone has a right and no one has a responsibility. Uh, when I was a child, uh, I can attest to this, when I was a child and I was at school and got in trouble, before I got home, my dad was home lying in wait. I got a spanking in school, I got one at home. What happens now? If the teacher raises their voice, they could have a parent up there grabbing at them because they're not supported. I'm not saying that they're right every time, but I'll tell you what. It's gotten to where the choice that people make, the choices that people are making, are not in accordance with God's Word. Is that, I mean... Is what my father did right? Yeah, I mean, when, when I was young and I thought he was harsh and rough, is, 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 was he doing the right thing? Well, according to the Bible, he says to train up your child the way he should go. This is in Proverbs, by the way, 22, 6. Train up a child the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't stray from it. Train him up in the way they should go. My father let me know very painfully and bluntly the decisions you make carry consequences. Your choice, and, and he said this, he said this, you have the choice not to get a spanking from me. I thought, <laughs> okay. He said, all you have to do is do the right thing. If you do the right thing, you won't get a spanking. Well, ADD. It's a little hard for me to do the wrong thing, the right thing all the time. But, and that's not a crutch, by the way. I'm not blaming that. I'm also blaming it on the fact that my what was it? What was it? The, the frontal, the frontal lobe of your brain's not quite developed until you're like 23. So before then, you don't realize consequences. That was me. I don't think it's developed yet. But the fact is, I was taught by mother and father that there are consequences to doing wrong. On the other hand, the consequences of doing right are pleasurable. Yes, you can go out to play baseball with this kid, or yes, you can go down to the lake and go swimming. Because you've been doing the right thing this week. But was it right for him to spank me? Right off, turn the page. As Bob Seeger would say, turn the page. Proverbs 23, verse 13. 
Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. So my father spanking my backside saved my soul from death. You better know it. Because understanding that in life there are consequences. Uh, I, I go back and I back talk to the teacher. She spanks my backside. And I go home and my dad lights me up. Teacher spanking never really hurt. But when I got home and my dad lit me up, I understood consequences. So that I, I, I listen in church and, and my dad or whoever was preaching at the time will say, if you don't accept Christ as your personal Savior, you are going to a devil's hell. I understood there's a consequence. And my choice, my choice, deemed whether I went or not. As some would say, uh, everybody gets a ticket to heaven when they die. Everybody gets a ticket to heaven. The question is, is it a one-way ticket or round trip? Because you're going to go up there and you're going to meet our maker face to face. And I read in my Bible, it says, every knee will bow. Every knee. So we're going to be on our face in front of God saying, oh man, I have messed up. And if we do not have an advocate, if we do not have Christ there saying, but I bought him. God's going to say, yeah, you did mess up. And there's nothing I can do for you. If you punish them, they will not die. And I don't mean beating, I mean spanking, punishing them correctly. In training horses, <clears throat> I uh, correct my horses. The punishment fits the crime. If I am if I am trying to get him to stand still or her, whichever gender I have to be, so far on our ranch has been hers. I got one him to train. But the if if this horse is standing still and I want him to stand still, great. If I sit my foot in the stirrup and they take a step, I back them up, speak harshly to them. Stick my foot in the stirrup. They step up, I back them up, speak harshly to them. If I walk out there to pet them and they bite me, their life turns to rubbish. Quickly. I do not beat them. I do not beat them. I'm not cruel to my animals. But I make it extremely uncomfortable for them to live at that point in time. Why? Because I don't want that rascal biting me. <laughs> if a horse kicks me, punishment fits the crime. I am going to turn their life to rubbish quickly. By the way, yes, I had to make that G rating. Uh, what ran through my mind was not G rating because I remember getting bit and kicked. So, <laughs> as Steve White said, it brings your uh, it, it brings your religion to the surface. <laughs> but. The truth of the matter is, if I don't correct this horse, uh, I have, a, I have a, a rule at my house. A horse of mine cannot touch me. I can touch this horse. I can initiate contact. Right? But that horse will not come up and nuzzle me, will not touch me, will not, nothing. <clears throat> Why? You're so mean. Don't you want him to hug on you? No! Because if I'm standing, you know, some traders have, a, have a, a bar that comes out when you open it. If I'm standing in front of that bar, they decide they want to hug. That's 11, 1,200 pounds pushing on my little buck 95. I ain't winning that, and it's going to hurt when I'm training them. I try to teach them. I make it uncomfortable for them to, when I put a saddle, if they buck, I make it uncomfortable. I make them run until they're through and their nose is dragging the ground going, this is going to kill me. 
Why? Because when I step in that saddle, I do not want them to even flinch. Punishment fits the crime. They make a choice. If they do the right thing, I love them. I pet on them. I was riding. I was riding a pony. We have we have miniatures and we have quarter horses and then we have a mixture of the two. I was riding one and it really looks funny because I can just almost touch the ground when I'm riding, riding the strap level. And I had her up at a trot, riding her back to the, to the pasture, and PJ was watching me. And when you got this long of legs on a horse with that short of legs, that trot beat you to death. So I pulled her up to a stop, and she stopped dead. Good girl. It don't matter that I ran into the saddle horn. That's a good girl. Good girl. I love on her. Why do I love on her? Because she did what I asked. And I made it comfortable for her. I walked her the rest of the way. No, I didn't walk. I walked her the rest of the way. If I'm training a horse and I try to, if the first few days and I tell them stop, and they stop, I don't care if I've been working with them two minutes, saddle comes off. Why? They're not tired? No, they're not. But they did the right thing. I've been talking horse training, but I want you to think about something. In our life, in our life, we make choices. <clears throat> now, PJ and I were talking about this today, as a matter of fact, uh, last night, today, I can't remember. We were talking about this. I, I make no, uh, I'm an open book, I make no, no bones about the fact that I have a problem. I'm an alcoholic recovering, but... I have a choice to make. Is it biblically wrong for me to buy a six pack of beer, put it in the refrigerator, and drink one every once in a while? No! No, I can show you several times in the Bible where that is not a sin. But I make a choice to do that knowing I've got a problem stopping or not to do that. I have that choice. My wife can't make that choice for me. She can make it uncomfortable if I do, but she's me. Uh, but I have that choice. So I make the choice. Now, God knows I have this problem. I have a feeling God gave me this problem or allowed me to do this to myself. For a specific reason. Keeps me humble. Keeps me if I have if I have problems, if I if I have wanna to, want to drink once in a while, I automatically lean on God. I call my wife, I'll call if she's not a I call one of the elders. I've I've had one of the elders to help me out on this. But if I want, I call and we pray. And they pray for me. I made a decision, and what happens? God takes that away. God takes that uncomfortable, uncomfortable feeling away. If I'm going through life and someone says, hey, why don't we go here and do this? I know it's wrong. I know what they're asking is wrong. If I go, God will make it uncomfortable for me. God will make it really uncomfortable. If I choose to say no, God don't want me doing that. God will bless me for that. What did he say to Solomon in uh, 2 Chronicles? He said, If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and seek my face, I will hear them from heaven I will bless them and I will heal their land. If you just do what God says, if you ask God, when things like this happen, if you just ask God and make the right choice, God will bless you. How many of us have gotten up one day and said, you know, I don't feel like going to work today? 
I do not want to go to work today. I'm sure Doug does it when it's a thousand degrees outside. He's got to go fix somebody's air conditioner. But do we get up? Well, shoot, yeah, there's consequences if we don't. We don't eat. Same thing in our spiritual life. Book of Romans. I just went back. Book of Romans. First chapter. 21st verse. I'm going to read that to you. It's a little lengthy, but that's all right. Romans, first chapter, 21st verse. This whole chapter is pretty good. Real good, as a matter of fact. But this is what I'm talking about today. He was talking about the people in the world. He said, although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish ears were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. He was talking about the people his people, the people of Israel at one time, uh, he was talking about the people before the flood of Noah. He was talking about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, which God destroyed. He was talking about all these people. They went, I mean, we're talking about God took them out of Egypt and brought them to a mountain. God spoke to Moses on the mountain. They decided he was taking too long, so they wanted a God. They built themselves a, a, a golden cow. They just watched God bring them through an ocean or a sea. He brought them through a sea. It's parted up. They walked on dry land. They watched Him give them, give them manna from heaven, quail they could walk by and pick up off the, off the ground. They'd like to hunt those. He, they watched all these wondrous things that God created, then they decided they needed a cow to worship. I've trailed them things. I don't want to worship a cow. I want to eat them. But they decided, they chose to turn away from God. What did God do? Made him stay out in the desert until everybody died to that generation. Was everybody 19 years or below died? <laughs> then they could go into the promised land. Everybody except what Joshua and, and, and Caleb and a few others. But God blessed Joshua. Joshua and Caleb were the two that say, No, we want to go in. We want to go beat them guys down. They said, No, we're scared of them. They're giants. We got God on our side. Man, let's go kick their backside, take their names and throw it away. Nope, nope, we're scared. God blessed them for their, for their uh, faithfulness. They got to go into the, the promised land. I've uh, been reading Kings here lately and, and reading about all the different ones, about all the guys that, that followed in David's footsteps. And, and worship God, and they were blessed for their time under the crown. And then there was the guys who chased after a different God, Baal and, and Asherah, which I read up on most of us a sermon of another time. That's a rough one. Baal and Asherah and Moloch. And get this. This is how great that those gods are. Well, they sacrificed their children in a fire. Oh, that was good. Let's worship that God. And God took them to the bank. 
send them off to be slaves for somebody else. The choices they make. But I'm talking, I'm talking thousands of years ago, all right? Thousands of years ago. We're making choices today. We're making choices where, where we grew up in a, in a Christian nation. And, and, and through our, our lifestyles, through our desire not to have God a part of us, we're turning it into a nation of, of paganism. We, we. I remember the old saying, the only, the, only, uh, the only thing it takes for evil to reign is for good people to stand up and do nothing. Something like that. So we are to blame. Why? Because we're not standing up. We're not beating down the doors and, and, and marching around the Capitol seven times and singing praises until they say, okay, I get it. We're a Christian nation again. We elect people that are, are, are popular. Come on, this guy, he is cool. Let's get him in office. Not people that say, hey, Look, we're going the wrong way. We need to get back and follow God. We need to get back and, and teach people there's consequences. We, as parents, need to get back and teach our kids there are consequences. I, I, I see it all the time. My brother's a teacher, and I, I hear it from him. I, I see it a lot where tablets or cell phones or laptops are babysitting our kids. Where did you learn that? From the stupid thing you got them watching. But these people are going, these kids are going in and shooting everybody in school. Where did they get that? They're playing it on their stinking computer. Daily. Every day. And we make the choice to let them. Train your child up in the way they should go and they will not stray. We have a choice to make. Are we going to be a child of God? Are we going to be a Christian? Are we going to accept Christ as our Savior? And when we do, are we going to follow Him? Are we going to take His guidance into us? And are we going to follow? If you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, if you're not a part of this family, I ask you to follow me in prayer. Lord, I've been on my own and I've been trying to do it by myself. Lord, I, I'm doing it wrong. Lord, I pray that you clean out my heart. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit. Empty the sin out of me. Seal me up. Lord, walk with me and guide me here on earth. All the way up into your, your arms in heaven. Lord, I pray that you, you lead me as I lead my family, as I lead my children, as my, I lead my brothers and sisters or family. I believe Christ died on the cross and taught me how to live. I believe that He... He was risen three days later and lives with you today. And he is coming back. As he sings in your name. Amen. If you have said that prayer at least once in your life, and if you accept Christ your Savior, we're going to have a communion, Lord's Supper. Our lay pastors are here. We're going to pass it out for us. Uh, I'm going to ask a blessing on the folks that are giving it out, folks that have made it. Ask Lord to bless this, and I'm going to uh, have a few words to say. Lord, I come to you asking forgiveness for my sins, and I thank you, Lord, for your Son Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Lord, I pray that you bless the ones that have put this Lord's Supper together, this communion, Lord. I pray a blessing on those who are here to serve it, and those who are partaking. Lord, I ask the same thing.
Tell you what, it's... This is something that is not, not to be taken with uh, stain on your heart. If you have something to separate you from God, if you, if you have a, a blotch on your soul, you, you have fought against your brother or sister or, or you just have been doing something that you shouldn't be, I pray you ask God's forgiveness. And if forgiveness you need from a brother and sister, that you leave here and ask forgiveness from them. Don't, don't forget that part. As Christ was gathered in the upper room with His disciples, He said, I'm not going to eat or drink of this again until I glorify the Lord. So God's work is done. So he took the bread and he broke it up and he blessed it. He passed it around to them. Likewise, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is my body that's broken for you. And as a cup, he said, this is, this is my blood, the new covenant that's shed for you. Often as you drink of this, uh, eat of this bread and drink of this cup do it in remembrance of me as we remember it we also need to uh, ask that he forgive us everybody serve I'm looking for a thumbs up everybody been served alright I'm going to give you a moment to pray and ask God to cleanse your soul and your heart. And then I'll lead us in prayer. Sunday, but every day of every week we're here. That's the same for your son's name.